Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. Hello, my name is Katherine Moore, social worker, mom, coffee lover, and founder of Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. I'm so excited you found my podcast. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We will hear the stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. Before we get started in this episode, I wanted to share a resource with you that I wish I knew about a long time ago. One that makes it easy to start a side business, to generate more income, so you stress less about your money, you're able to pay your student loans without worry, and you're able to afford those online shopping sprees. I see you, no judgment here, I am with you. And what's so great is that as social workers, we have so many powerful skill sets that other people want and need to learn from us. This is such an impactful way to continue making massive change in the world without spending a lot of extra time on this. So I personally use Kajabi to create my online course and I absolutely love it. And right now they're giving away free trials. So click the link in the show notes to get started on your side biz now. And with that, let's get into this episode. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Social Workers Rise. This week, we're talking with Kimberly, and she is a fellow medical social worker, and we talk all things medical social work. She also works with teenagers, children, and families, so we dive deep into how to help teenagers and kids deal with grief because there's been a lot of loss this year, and it's really important that we're able to support our kids through all of these changes. So I had so many questions for her and I'm so grateful that she was able to come on the podcast and just answer all my questions. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's hop into it. Hi. Hi, Kim. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. It's rainy here on the East Coast. So where are you? It's a bit of a bummer. (laughs) Pennsylvania. Nice. Very nice. proud of Pennsylvania this past week. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you guys pulled through. <laughs> we did. We did. <laughs> you got Biden into office. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very proud of I'm about 40 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Extremely happy with Philadelphia. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we connected, we've been in contact for a couple months now, and I feel like we have a lot in common. We both have podcasts that we're doing, Mm -hmm. and we're both medical social workers, and we're both moms. Yep, yep. And I think we both love California, too. (laughs) I agree. Yes, I do love it here in California. (laughs) Yeah, we did. It's been, um, I took your course that you offered that you and Leslie offered. Um, And I am, you know, going to tell you again, how grateful I am for the opportunity. It was a great course. Um, I really enjoyed it. And then I just really have been enjoying your podcast. 
Good, good. Well, you're welcome. And the course was the clinical essentials for the future mm-hmm. therapist, which it's going, I'm, I'm actually, I haven't told anybody, but it's going to be available on a regular basis. And we're going to be doing the group, the group part of the course, uh, like every couple of months. So, but you know, for 2021, I'm going to start making it to where you can just purchase, purchase it at any time. And then if you wanted to hop in for the group coaching sessions, then you can do that too, just to leave it a little bit more open and less restrictive. Um, and I know that you are, um, I believe when you do the introduction, you talk a little bit about like newer social workers. Um, I've been a social worker for 15 years and just me taking that again really helped to remind me of some things that maybe I had forgotten since grad school. And also it really has upped my documentation when I'm doing it, um, you know, in my charts. So I just wanted to thank you again for that. Hey, that's amazing. That is Mm -hmm. so great. Thank you. And I'll be honest, I learned a lot of stuff too, just doing the research and working with Leslie, because we all have different therapeutic styles and different skill sets. So when we come together, like we did in this course, it's magic. It's so Mm -hmm. amazing. It it, it, it was great. It was really good. Good, good. So I'm, I want to know your story. How did you get started into social work to begin with? So um, I, I've always been a helper at heart, I would say. I always, from when I was little, I know that I was really high on the empathy, but always, um, you know, want to know how people felt and really be mindful of people's feelings So I always felt like I knew I wanted to be in a helping profession. I just really didn't know what that would was called then. And then as I got older, I did do some medical um, classes and did medical assisting for a while, but really decided um, after my bachelor's, which I got uh, in my late twenties in organizational development that I really wanted to be a social worker. So I went and got my master's. And um, if I could just do another little mention of uh, Joe Biden, Joe Biden was my key, was our keynote speaker at the comm- our commencement, our graduation commencement. And wow. so, yeah, it was really amazing. And just, um, you know, if I, one of the things that I remember about him was that he was as proud of us graduating as um, I was of myself. So it was really great. Um, and, you know, I did some internship. I stayed at my internship, which was at a cancer support community for a number of years. And um, I had gone back then after that to an a organization that I had worked in when I had my bachelor's, which was the Gift of Life Donor Program, which is our region's organ and tissue uh, donor program, and I worked with donor families after the loss of their loved ones, which was really a profound and just an amazing experience. Wow! So you've yeah. been working with, and essentially with loss and grief and medical social work for kind of a long time. I have, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, you know, like, like you had mentioned, I have three kids, and so um, you know, juggling working full time, which I think you can relate to. And having kids um, was difficult for a little bit of that. But, you know, we managed and um, I actually left Gift of Life just because the commute uh, was just so hard to come from Philadelphia. And like I said, with traffic, it's about an hour and an hour and a half, maybe outside from where I live. And so um, I just needed to leave for a little bit and focus on my kids. And then um, recently I'm... uh, got back into um, oncology and work for a local community hospital and do oncology social work. I love that. So what is different or unique about oncology social work versus other fields of medical social work? Well, I think it's, it's specific in the sense that it's cancer related, but there is so many different types of cancer, right? So I deal with everything, breast cancer, prostate, um, pancreatic, all of those different diagnoses. Um, 
so I don't know if there's uh, anything specifically different. I think that really the needs for a patient are pretty much the same as what you see, right? Um, they want to be they want to be heard, they want to be respected, and they want somebody to care about what's happening in their lives and their families' lives. And um, I've just seen a lot of people really struggling in the sense, like I, with COVID, because of the stay at home, there were certain um, there were certain uh, treatment options that weren't really available, like you know screenings and things like that, because of COVID. So I think it's just really ramped up our need to um, go back and have our mammograms done, go back and have our screenings done and get that really a priority for our families and for even our loved ones to go make sure they're doing that. Yeah, definitely. I have seen working in palliative care, you know, we're not quite hospice, but our people are, are going usually going that route in the next six months to a year. And so with the COVID, I've, I've seen good and bad things, shifts happen in the way that people are getting their medical care. And I don't know if you can, you know, relate to this, but the good part is that things are becoming more accessible to people who need to stay at home. Mm -hmm. And I think the bad thing is the isolation, the, the lack of physical connectiveness and, and emotional connectiveness that we need as human beings to really, you know, be living the best life that we can in any given moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that you had just done a talk recently, right, at the NASW in California about relationships. Yes. And, um, and, and I think that it's so important uh, that during this time, people felt so isolated um, because they weren't able to get out and have dinner with friends or have somebody come over and have a cup of coffee with them, things like that. So um, I think you're right in that aspect. Absolutely. Yes. And loneliness actually has the same impact on our health that smoking 15 cigarettes a day does. So it's very detrimental to our physical health and our mental and emotional well-being as well. So it's, you know, it, it's good that we have these sports that are more mobile and more tech based for some people who can access those because other people can't access those be, they're just not there and they're not, they don't have the capacity to learn a new skill. They're just trying mm -hmm. to survive and get to their chemo treatment. <laughs> yep. They're not, they're not trying to figure out zoom. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. It's too much. Just, um, and it's, it's interesting because, um, I was really fortunate, um, when COVID had hit like late in February and then, um, we had had a family party for my cousin's 50th, the 8th of March. So if you can look at that timeline, the 8th of March, and then that week, that Friday, which was Friday the 13th, um, that was my last day in the office for almost until September. Wow. So I was working from home um, and I was connecting with, with my patients via phone calls and doing some support groups via Zoom which was a whole new, something completely different, right? For some of our, some of our families, something completely new and different in their healthcare. Yeah. So how was that doing the Zoom support groups? Because I know that that has been a big shift for a lot of support groups. So mm -hmm. how was that? <laughs> I mean, it was funny because it's just like, you know, when you're on a meeting at Zoom, right? You just don't know who's going to talk. <laughs> like everybody right. talks at once <laughs> or no one talks at all. So um, it was, it was, um, it was challenging for some, but once we got the hang of it, it, it was, it was flowing um, better. And I was even, I've even started to bring little guest speakers come in to speak for about 20 minutes into our Zoom because we're still doing Zoom support groups. We're not, um, we're not ready to bring people back into support groups. So um, we have been having, able to have some people step in and do a brief talk on, you know, um, medicinal juicing, or um, you know, we just had one on genetics. And so 
were able to do that, which breaks it up a little bit so that they're able to learn a little bit and still talk. I like that. Yeah. And it probably makes the guest speakers and it allows for greater accessibility among people who actually need it, um, which is really good. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. Do you think that these virtual support groups are here to stay or do you think they're a fad? Um, I I guess it really depends on where we go with COVID. I, I know in speaking to some of the people in our support groups, they really want to be together again. Um, I think getting back to your loneliness and the connectivity, they want to be connected and see each other and actually be able to have an eye to eye conversation. And so maybe we would do it for bigger um, events. Like I'm not, I know that I'm not ready to set, to, to set foot into a conference room, but um, I think hopefully at some point we'll be able to do some type of, you know, maybe 10, 15 uh, individuals in a, in a circle, you know, a good distance apart and be able to have some type of support group. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like that. It was interesting because for the, the big conference, there was over a hundred people in my seminar and in a way it was good for me because it was my first seminar and I think if I were to walk into a room with a hundred people, I might have a panic attack um, <laughs> <laughs> doing public speaking in front of all those people. Mm-hmm. But on Zoom, I only saw myself. And so I feel like I was able to be less nervous and I tried to have some fun and be myself, but it's hard because then you just feel like you're talking to yourself and you don't get <laughs> that that interaction and that validation and, and you can't see if people are following you, if they're falling asleep, if they get it, if they're lost. So, you know, that part is challenging, but I did integrate where we were doing break off groups and I put people in with five or six other people to where they can talk amongst themselves about specific prompts. And a lot of the feedback was that they loved it. Yeah. So, great. Yeah, so I thought that was really interesting because it was completely experimental on my part. <laughs> I didn't know how it was going to go. But it was it was great to see that people were open to talking with strangers, essentially, and mm-hmm. building those relationships. So that was um, – there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of potential for technology that I'm personally excited for. I think we're just getting mm-hmm. started. I agree. I agree. Um it's, you're far more advanced than I am going into breakout rooms. I haven't even been able to to, to put my arms around that yet. So I'm going to let you handle the breakout rooms. <laughs> well, <laughs> I haven't okay. done that yet. <laughs> Full disclosure, they did have a techie girl who was there to help me as my support. <laughs> <laughs> you had a little help. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so, um, So, yeah, so that part for support groups I think is really really valuable and a lot of the pushback that I got for from my patients and caregivers mostly about why they don't attend support groups is because they don't have time and they don't have someone to stay with their parents Mm -hmm. so that Mm -hmm. excuse kind of has gone out the door (laughs) yeah yeah and now it's more of like well you know I just don't want to which is fine um yeah but yeah it takes away that barrier yeah. Um, and also you had mentioned about palliative. I do work with palliative and hospice uh, sometimes. And um, they have been, you had said something about being more mobile and accessible to the patients at our home. And our, our hospice, obviously, and our palliative do go out to patients' homes. So that has kind of kept that connection as well. Mm-hmm. That's really good. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, oncology, I feel like is oncology social work, I feel is special because you're going to be talking with people who, of all ages. So for me, a typical hospice is going to be, there might be some people in their 40s and 50s, but not very many. Um, but with oncology, I've seen 
a lot of younger people like in Mm -hmm. their 40s and 50s and maybe you see people even younger than that so Mm -hmm. you're really dealing with the whole family yep yep kids parents you know of, of like you said like a 40 or a you know 38 year old you know mom dad who have kids who have parents still alive who have cousins you know it's definitely it 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 affects the entire family and it affects generations as well so you know because if you have somebody who's got um, testing or does a genetic testing and you find that there's some lineage to this type of cancer then people are now fully aware and I mean that's a great thing too right because now you have this information and you can you can get your, you know, like we're talking about breast cancer, you can get your mammograms, you can do your, your screenings, and you can really, it's always in the back of your head. But then that's also, it's always in the back of your head, right? Mm-hmm. It's always there. So, yeah, and even, that, yeah. That's so hard. And, and it, it does affect the whole family. And, you know, you and I were talking before about the kids and, mm-hmm children and teenagers, they cope much differently than we do as adults. And it can be misconstrued in so many different ways. Um, And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and kind of how you work with those, with those kiddos and with those teens and with the parents too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things when I first got out of grad school, like I had said earlier, I worked with what is now called Cancer Support Community. But before that, it was called Gilda's Club. And so for those that are listening and for you, you may remember you may remember Gilda Radner um, who died from ovarian cancer. And she, um, her husband, Gene Wilder, had started Gilda's Club after she died. And it was a cancer support community for not only the patient, um, but also for the caregivers. And one of the things that they really focused on was Noogie Land, which was specifically for the kids. So it was a place where kids could meet up with other kids who had family members who were living with a cancer diagnosis, and they could just be kids. They could have a teen group, and they would have conversations, and but they would do activities. They would cook. So it was really embracing the whole family for, you know, for the condition that this, that their loved one was dealing with. So I think what that taught me is that kids need to be included in the conversation of, you know, any, I would say any illness. And of course you need to be sensitive with how much you share with them, but including them makes them feel like they are a part of the care team a a part of caregiving and it gives them an opportunity to be a caregiver and that they feel like things aren't being said behind their back and they're not a part of it. So it's really important to embrace them and to bring them along, be it with sensitivity and making sure that they can handle it, but include them in those conversations. Um, A couple of years ago, another social worker, a friend of mine started Hands Holding Hearts which is an organization um, based in Newtown, Pennsylvania, that is for kids that are living with grief and bereavement um, after the loss of a loved one, whether it be um, you know grandparent, parent, brother, sister, uncle, and we help. Um, we do activities with them. We have a camp, and we do one-on-one counseling. So, that's I think that's really important that that kids just feel that they're a part of the family during difficult times like this. Yeah, I think that's so special. I'm wondering, I'm trying to put myself in the mind of a child and I'm guess like, so there's all these camps. Do, can you talk about how do the camps help the kids? I mean, are the kids feeling left out? Do they just need special support? Like, you know, how are these camps helpful for them? Well, so I think they're just like a regular camp, right? You know, when you send your kid to a regular camp, the feeling is the same. They're with other kids. I mean, the, I guess the line that, that ties them together is the fact that they have lost somebody. 
but we do activities like we do baking activities, but we will do grief specific activities. You know, like we may have them build a, a screen box, which screen box, which is just basically a box that we have them decorate and construct. And um, then they build, they put like a, you know, toilet paper, um, you know, the cardboard piece of the toilet paper into a hole in the box. And when they're feeling particularly frustrated or angry, the thought is that they can scream into that box. You know, they can kind of like capture that feeling and just put it into the box and just let it stay there and kind of unleash it a little bit. Um, so that's like one of the activities that we do, but we'll do other activities through the week. It's usually a week long, um, but there's so many other great camps out there as well. I know like the Dougie Center up in Washington State, that has been around for years and that's a, a great support and they have camps for kids up there too. So I think that camps are just as fun for kids that are grieving that go to a grief camp, you know, as if they went to any other camp. It's a time to be together, be with like-minded kids that are experiencing similar things and have the chance to work some things out, work some emotions out. Yeah, what a powerful activity that scream box because then it takes that anger out and it makes it its own entity and you can trap it in the box. And how empowering to feel like you can do that. Yep. And that the scream doesn't have to be like an ugly thing, right? It just doesn't have to be that anger doesn't have to be ugly when you decorate it, you know, like kids decorate it with flowers and butterflies and so it's not it's a part of you because you're sad but it doesn't have to be anything that you're afraid of you can get it out and it can be like you said trapped in this box and it doesn't have to be an ugly box Hmm. I like that that's powerful and I would also imagine that being around other kids who have also lost a loved one makes it makes it what's the word that I'm looking for normal Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, normal. There you go. <laughs> because at school, you you know, it's like bring your your mom to bring your dad to school day or daddy and donuts, you know, all these things mm-hmm. that are are asking parents to show up and it can be I would imagine it could be very isolating um and very awkward and emotional having to answer questions to kids cuz kids are oh my gosh, kids are vicious. Um, they are. <laughs> And they're highly perceptive. (laughs) Yes, yes. And so it can be, I imagine it can be very um, validating and and just, like you said, bring back that normal, normalcy of, of, oh, there are other kids like me. I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. How powerful that is. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I'm also wondering, you know, children show grief differently than what we do. They don't necessarily have the words for grief. And there's definitely been a huge sense of loss and change and grief with a lot of kids this year because they've gone through so many changes of change to their school, maybe change to their teachers. Um, Maybe their parents have had a change in job or lost their job. So a lot of different changes going on you know, I know for my daughter, Chuck E. Cheese has been closed down. So she's like, why can't we go to the indoor <laughs> playground? You know, and how do you explain to a three-year-old? Well, you know, there's there's coronavirus and, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, mm-hmm. it just doesn't, you know, it's hard. So, um, and that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So how do kids show their grief and express it? And then how can we as adults as, as parents, as social workers, as counselors, how can we support them? That's a really good question. And I think for parents um, who know their children probably better, right, than, than anyone, um, it's really looking at the way that they're, they're processing this. You know, kids are going through a lot of, and, and families are going through a lot of what, what we would call secondary losses. You know, they're, for the kids who aren't going back to school, it's the loss of their peer group. It's their loss of their teachers, the connection with their teachers. And even though they may, they may gripe about not being, you know, not going to sleep, about going to school, actually, 
um, some kids feel really disconnected and sad that they're not going to school. And so I would just really watch, you know, their behavior and their, are they spending too much time alone? Are they not engaging with family conversations and, and discussions? Is their behavior a little bit different than what you've seen? And, and always try to engage, you know, always as, as the parent, as the grandparent, always just try to check in and have those little conversations to be like, there's, if there's anything you want to talk about, you can tell me anything. And um, there's always the, I'm listening, I'm here for you, I'm with you. Um, but I think kids are grieving on a level of just missing, again, I go back to normal, even though normal is really, like, I, I, I never say new normal, because it will never be normal again, you know, from this point on. But I think they're missing what their lives were prior to COVID. Would you agree to that, that you see that? Oh, yeah, Definitely. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I think that you also have to um, look at the fact and, and look that they're stressed as parents are stressed, they're overwhelmed. And, you know, and also, you know, maybe from a parent perspective, think about, I had just read this article and one of the tips was, you know, um, when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, use, um, use the acronym HALT, H-A-L-T which asked yourself, you know, are you or are they hungry? Is this, is this behavior coming because they're hungry? Um, are they angry? Are they lonely? And are they tired? Right, so if you kind of work through that and say, okay, I can answer these questions that they're, they, maybe they're hungry. I mean, I don't know about your daughter, but when my kids are hungry, the emotions are high, everything's wrong. <laughs> you know, you just yes. can't win and you're just like, I'm just yes. gonna throw a pizza in for you. Okay. <laughs> yes. And- Hung hungry and tired and mm-hmm. angry all together. Oh, forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> they just they just melt. They just mm-hmm. melt and then put everything, grief and, and and sadness on top of that. So um, you know, we're really we just need to be, we just need to be present. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, maybe I'm just a big kid, but when I'm hungry, angry, lonely, <laughs> and tired, I'm a hot mess. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> I don't think that's a West I mean, coast, East coast thing. I think that's just... <laughs> no. the human thing. <laughs> it is. It is. Yes. Mm-hmm. I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Halt. I like that. Um, yeah, because there's just been so many changes. And, you know, do, do you know the number one or the the population that feels the loneliness, the loneliest right now is actually our the teenagers. Mm-hmm. So the gen- generation, what do they call them, Z? Um, oh, I don't, I can't keep up with their generation. Like I what don't know, but is. the people who are 17 to 24 in that range they are feeling the loneliest right now, um, which mm-hmm. makes me scared for them because, you know, then we start um, monitoring for for red flags for suicidal ideation. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. because lon- loneliness is a huge risk factor for suicidal ideation. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, you know, to your point, you know, 18 to 24 is their launch time, right? Like that's the time that they are, I have an 18 year old. Well, she'll be 18 in February, but that's the time when she's supposed to be ready to go out into the world, college, you know, full-time job, graduate from uh, high school. And those things are just not happening for a lot of kids between 18 and 24. And so, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point that you just brought up. Yes. It's yeah. It's a big change. So and just, I don't have all of the signs of suicidal ideation off the top of my head, but I know if, if they're starting to talk about death, if they're starting to give their things away, if they are starting to isolate themselves, if they are, um, sometimes they might be cutting to, to just, they use it as a sense of mindfulness to get themselves, you know, kind of out of their head and, and refocused. Um, so definitely, you know, reaching out to them and just letting them know, like, Hey, I've, I'm here for you and I love you and you're not alone. And, 
and you know we can talk about it and just mm-hmm. being non-judgmental and non-confrontational and and don't minimize right whatever it is that they tell you right right and and ask them right are, are you thinking about hurting yourself mm-hmm. you know yeah and yeah absolutely yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, thank you, Kim. We have covered a lot today. We have. We have. So, so I um. We oh my gosh, we haven't even talked about your podcast. So what is <laughs> your podcast? What do you have going on over there? Um. So I have a podcast with another social work friend. Um. Her name is Amy as well. I've got a lot of Amys in my life. Um. It's Fill Your Cup First podcast, and it is a podcast that really bridges the gap between what we know about how important self-care is and how we practice that in our own lives. So we have discussions, we have um, guests. I'm hoping to have you Catherine on as a guest guest soon. Um, And really just talks about that self-care is, it doesn't have to be something that you pay for. I mean, though we love our massages and, you know, we love our um, spa days. Maybe it doesn't have to be that it can be, an hour of just reading your favorite book or getting outside in nature. It doesn't have to be something that you pay for. And um, even understanding your own mental health and, you know, what are your joys? And when you when you know that you're exhausted, what can you do? So that's really the conversation that we have. And we also, like I said, we bring in some people that just talk about, you know, how to let go of some technology and and have downtime away from technology and people that are doing some really great things in our world. Awesome. I'm so Mm -hmm. excited to join you on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Whenever you can have me, I will be there. That is so, so needed. And, you know, um, I feel like as a new social worker, I would hear, oh, self-care, self-care. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's for like everyone (laughs) else. I'm fine. But no, really. It's just like your like your physical health. You have to do it every single day. And mm-hmm. your self-care, your mental health is the same thing. You need to actively work on it and actively nurture it every single day um, or else just like your physical health, if you neglect it after a long time, like at first you'll be okay and you'll be fine. But after a long time, um, you will begin to, to notice changes and... Um, and those changes are not going to be good. So just do right. your self care every day. <laughs> right, right. And like you said, I mean, I know that you're working a lot on burnout and, you know, you want to prevent burnout. And honestly, um, our, our podcast, um, we stopped recording, I think, end of January, and we haven't recorded yet because we, with COVID being so prominent, we actually said to ourselves, the best thing that we can do for our self care as we're, you know, transitioning out of work, as we're helping our kids at school at home at school and dealing with emotions there, let's stop recording for a couple of months. And so Mm -hmm. we're hoping to get back in January full on and talk a little bit about what we went through over this past year, but also bringing in other people with expertise like yourself. Awesome. So can people subscribe so that when you release your episodes in in January, then they'll get notified? Yes. And there's actually um, there, they can find us on, uh, Spotify, Apple, we're still, our back issues are there. I, I don't know if you call them issues or podcasts are there still. So you could always listen uh, listen to those and just kind of, you know, get an understanding of what we're talking about. So they're still available. Oh, that's great. So we can go binge, wa- binge listen to <laughs> Fill Your Cup. You can subscribe. Fill Your Cup first. Mm-hmm. Yes. Fill Your Cup first. Subscribe. Podcast. And, and yeah. And w- let's continue the conversation over there. Um, you know, soon. So thank you so much, Kim. I really appreciate you thank being you, on the Social Workers Rise podcast. It was it's so nice talking to you. <laughs> yes, you too. Take care, Kim. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.
Thank you so much for hanging out with me on Social Workers Rise. If you are looking to add another stream of income while making massive impact on the world, then I highly recommend creating your own online course. I personally use Kajabi and highly recommend it. They make it super easy to turn what you know into what you do. Click the link in the show notes to get started today. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you loved it, write a review and give us five stars wherever you listen to your podcast. This just helps other people just like you find us and join our community. Also, I would love to connect with you on Instagram. You can find me at Social Workers Rise. I can't wait to see you next week. Bye.